we're looking, I think this is on page five of your unit handout, we're looking at motion. And we're only doing one example today. Uh, it doesn't seem like an overly complicated example, but some of the applications that you're going to run into when you're working on today's practice will change that viewpoint. The thing I want to begin with here is telling you that the problems we solve in this lesson and in this branch of calculus, some of them might be solvable using formulas from a physics 2030 formula sheet, but not all of them are. Okay. We have to use calculus to solve all of these problems. And at some point in today's lesson, I'm going to explain to you where the formulas on a physics 20 and 30 formula sheet come from in terms of motion. And I'll explain to you why we can't rely on them always working here. So we're going to use concepts of differentiation and anti-differentiation to solve basically kinematics problems, problems involving position, velocity, and acceleration. But those of you who do take physics, there's some differences here that we're going to have to make sure we clarify. So remember that the derivative with respect to time of position gives you velocity. And all this means, and I hope you remember, by the way, we use S of t for position. What this means is that differentiation is the process that goes from position to velocity. And as well, the derivative with respect to time of velocity will give you acceleration. So all I'm telling you here is differentiation will take you in this direction. This is exactly the same thing that we were talking about a couple days ago, except now, instead of just saying maybe capital F of X, F of X, and F prime of X, we're talking about specific functions that mean something in the world. It follows that the antiderivative of acceleration is velocity, and the antiderivative of velocity will give you position. So there's something I think you need to be aware of, and it's an interesting idea. It's that when you differentiate, you never lose any information about what's going on. You don't. But when you anti-differentiate, you do. Because there's that unknown constant when you anti-differentiate. Like there is only one derivative of a function. But there's lots of anti-derivatives of a function. So we have to keep that in mind. Now, there's a huge difference between how we treat position in physics in high school and how we treat position in math in high school. In physics, whenever you solve a problem, say in physics 20, the initial position is always thought of as being zero, which is kind of weird. But if you solve a problem in physics 20 where you throw an object up and you discover, you're not told the height, but you discover that out of your formula, the displacement is negative 23, that means that it ends up 23 meters lower than where it started. So by implication, you're saying where it starts is zero, which is really very awkward. What we like to do in math is say the ground is zero. And, and that totally makes sense. Because that way, when I say what is the position of this calculator, let's just say it's on the ground, and what is the position of this pen, they're both at the same position. It doesn't matter how they got there. Whereas, you know, if I said, what is the position of the calculator, and you said negative 23, and I said, what is the position of the pen, you said negative 53, because it started 53 meters above, that doesn't make any sense. They're, they have the same position on the ground. The constants in the antiderivative are related to the initial conditions of the object's motion. Let's see what this means. So, a small frozen Cornish game hen is thrown upwards at 4 meters per second from the edge of an 85 meter cliff near the surface of the earth. So, when does the hen reach its maximum height? What is the maximum height? And how long is the hen in the air? It's frozen because I don't want it flying away. Okay? Um, whether you take high school physics or not, you are expected to know that the acceleration due to gravity in this part of Alberta, which is what we would use on exams, is, I got a bit of a mistake there, is 9.8 meters per, meters per second squared downward. I really ought to have a negative on there, right? So this should say the, the amount of the acceleration due to gravity. So we're going to have to use that. 
Now what that means is we know the acceleration as a function of time is negative 9.8. It's not even as a function of time because if you know some elementary physics, you understand that the acceleration is uniform. In fact, I guess as an object gets closer to the Earth, the acceleration due to gravity increases in magnitude a little bit more because it's closer to the center of the Earth. But you know we're not going to worry about that. That increases so we as to be easily ignored. Where we're going with all of these problems is if you want to answer questions about the motion of this pen, then you need to know the velocity function and the position function. I mean, let's face it. When does the hand reach its maximum height? Well, that's going to be when v of t is equal to 0. That's just common sense. An object reaches the maximum height of its trajectory, assuming it's straight up and straight down. It reaches the maximum height of its trajectory when it stops moving. So in order to answer this first bullet, we need to know the velocity function so we can set it equal to 0 so we can solve for the time. On the other hand, what is the maximum height? Well, the maximum height of the hen will be S of the time to the top, which is the time we find in the first bullet. Well, you can't find the position of the hen at that point in time unless you have a position function. So we need the position function. Um, how long is the hen in the air? Well, that's going to be the solution to this equation. Because when the hen reaches the ground, it will no longer be in the air. So we need to find these functions. Well, the antiderivative of acceleration gives you velocity. So this is going to have to contain a t. Because the derivative of t is a constant. It's going to have to contain the negative 9.8 plus some constant which I'm going to label as C1. Let's not worry about finding that constant. Let's anti-differentiate again. While we're in that groove of doing that thing, we can anti-differentiate this function with respect to t. And this is going to be negative, and it will have to be t squared. But that means the coefficient has to be something that when you multiply by 2 gives you 9.8, which is 4.9. So we get negative 4.9 t squared. And if from time to time I slip and say 9.81 or 4.905, that's because I'm thinking of the number we would use in physics. Plus the antiderivative of c1 would have to be c1 times t. Plus an arbitrary constant, which I'm going to call c2. And Although this problem itself is not that difficult, everybody, I want to make some connections between high school physics and high school, high school calculus. And I think, I'm pretty sure everybody here has taken physics 20. So on a physics 20 formula sheet, you have this formula. I'm going to write it. Mm, doesn't matter where I write it. I'm going to write acceleration equals delta v. Uh, I'm not even going to use the vector symbols. Over delta t. I mean, in physics, we go oh, vector symbols, vector symbols. In math, we just go, you better include the direction. Delta v is vf minus vi. And delta t is just t. And if you rearrange this, you get Vf equals At plus Vi. Are you with me on that? OK. Well, let's just park that, shelve it for a second, and let's find out the constant in V of t. I know the following based on the question, that when t is 0, V is 4. Am I wrong? Did I not see 4 meters per second up? 
That's the initial speed. Oh, that's the initial speed, initial conditions. What this means is if I put into my velocity function 0 for t, I'm going to get 4 for v. Oh, well, c1 is 4 then. This is why we call it an initial condition, is when we talk about motion, the constant is the initial value of that variable. So what we end up with is 4 equals the constant. So our velocity function is this. It's negative 9.8t plus 4. But that's what this formula in green is. It's saying the velocity at some later point in time is the acceleration times the time plus the initial velocity. When Newton invented calculus, he invented calculus, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons, was so that he could solve physics problems. Okay. Before I go on and talk about the position function, two things. Does anybody have any questions regarding the velocity function? that we found. Okay, secondly, I just want you to make a mental note that in the velocity function in physics there is a VI. In physics in high school there's always a VI and a VF, but there's not a DI and a DF. What there is in physics is D and in physics, D is not position, it's displacement. It's the change in the position. Which is why if an object starts at the top of the cliff and ends up 23 meters below, we say D in physics is negative 23. It's the change in the position. Keep that in mind. Now, let's find the constant in our position function. I'm going to rewrite this position function now because I know one of the constants. The position as a function of time is negative 4.9t squared plus 4 times t, because that c1 is 4, plus this constant. Well, how are we going to find that constant? Well, we can look at information regarding the position of the object given in the question. And what we are told in the question, everybody, is that at the beginning, initially, initially, the position is 85 meters. It's 85 meters above the ground, and the ground is position 0, so this is 85. I'll show my work, but I hope you see that this is going to demonstrate to us that C2 is 85. So we're going to get 85 equals negative 4.9 times 0 squared. This seems like just a waste of time, I know. We're showing here that the constant in the position function is 85, which is the initial position. That's why it's called initial conditions. So now we have position equals negative 4.9. Well, I'll, I'll, I shouldn't do that. We have 85 equals C2, which means we have the position function. The position function now will be s of t equals negative 4.9 t squared plus 4t plus 85. So this function, everybody, has a parallel in high school physics. Right? This function kind of has a parallel in high school physics. The high school physics equation is D equals VIT plus one-half AT squared. So that negative 4.9 is one-half A, and then there's the T squared. 
the VIT is the 4T. What's the deal with the 85? Well, you know, if we had, you know how we have a VI in high school physics, if we had a DI, then things would just be perfect, but we don't. What that means is that if you subtract this di, which really should be there, to the other side, you get the final position minus the initial position, which is the displacement. And that's why in high school physics, this d on the left is not position. It's displacement. It's not where the object is. It's where it is compared to where it started. So this formula here, d equals vit plus a half at squared, comes from calculus. It comes from the fact that it's the antiderivative of the antiderivative of the acceleration. These formulas, by the way, these formulas only work for uniform acceleration. What do I mean by that? Constant acceleration. If the acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, those formulas would work. But for things in physics and chemistry, when you get to post-secondary things in engineering, the acceleration is not always a constant. It's variable. Maybe the acceleration of an object is defined by being 0.2 sine t, where the acceleration is continually changing. All right. We have our formulas now. What was the first question? The first question was, what is the maximum? No. When? 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 Does it reach the maximum? Okay. So the first question is the time to the max position, height. Well, we have our velocity function, v of t equals negative 9.8. t plus 4. Am I right? I'm just trying to remember. I think that's right. So to the maximum height, at the maximum height, that would be where v of t is 0. So you have to take 0 equals negative 9.8 t plus 4 and solve that for t. The thing I personally like about solving these types of physics problems using calculus is it demonstrates an understanding of what's going on. It's not just a, which formula do I use, where do I put the numbers. You're understanding what's going on. So we solve this, and you end up with t is equal to whatever 4 divided by 9.8 is. I subtract the 4 over, and I divide by negative 9.8. So t is equal to that number, which in brackets we can put a decimal approximation. It's going to be pretty close to 0.4. Let me just move my, move my calculator over. I'll just write it down to a couple decimals, but I want to keep track of it on my calculator. Uh, about 0 0.408. I'll go 0 0.41 because that's the space that I have. But about 0 0.41 seconds. Now, the second bullet is what is the maximum height, I believe. Well, that's going to be that. It's going to be the position of the object at that point where it stops. And in physics, you would then have to add the height of the cliff. Because when you put that time into your physics formula, all you're finding out is how much higher than it, where it started, it lands, what lands, is. So then you go plus the height of the cliff. You don't have to do this here. When we take, let's see if I remember this, negative 4.9 t squared plus 4t plus 85, yes, and I put t equals 0 0.41 in, I guess I could have done it right there. I'm going to get the maximum height.
negative 4.9 times that answer squared plus 4 times that answer plus 85. Negative 4.9 t squared plus 4t plus 85 gives me a maximum height of 86 meters. A, a paltry 0.8 meters higher than where it started. You throw something up at 4 meters per second, it's not going to be going up very long before gravity causes it to move down. You should probably look at changing this to something where that, the, the height is considerably more than where it started. However, the maximum height is 85.8. And then the last one was the time in the air. Well, that's going to be when S is equal to zero. And, and you know, thank, thankfully, this is a calculus class. You don't have to go, well, if you haven't taken math 20, then you have to break this path into pieces and add them together. We know how to solve quadratic formulas here, or quadratic equations. So I'm just going to set zero equal to negative 4.9t squared plus 4t plus 85. And I'm not going to waste my time thinking about factoring that. The, the, the likelihood that this is factorable is, is slim. So I am going to calculate b squared minus 4ac, but not because I want to know if it's factorable. If I calculate b squared minus 4ac and it happens to be a perfect square, then I probably wouldn't try to factor it anyway. So I'm calculating it so that I can use the quadratic formula. Well, you're going to calculate it for me. I'm going to take a little mental break here. Uh, negative b would be negative 4. I'm not even going to write it down. You guys know the quadratic formula. Negative b, which would be negative 4, plus or minus the square root of the discriminant, all over 2a. 2a is negative 9.8. And you have to calculate for me b squared minus 4ac. 1682. 1682. Bang on? Yeah. OK. Anybody else? That's good. I guess it's bang on because between the product of 5 and the 4s involved, you're going to have 10s, maybe even 100s. It gets rid of the decimals. Uh, 1682 is not a perfect square, I don't think. Let's, we're not going to waste our time simplifying this. This is a, an applied math problem. We want a decimal answer. Of course, we're going to get two solutions. The only way you wouldn't get two solutions if, is if that discriminant was either negative, in which case you'd have no solutions, or if the discriminant was zero, in which case you'd have one. I'm going to go ahead and go negative 4 minus the square root of 1682 and then divide by negative 9.8. A little bit of you know, common sense goes a long way. I'm guessing that the square, oh, I'm not guessing. The square root of 1682 is bigger than 4. So if I take negative 4 plus that, the top of this will be positive. The bottom will be negative. I cannot have a negative time. So I'm getting about 4.6 seconds. You know, sometimes I think it's okay for me to cut corners. If you want to calculate the other one, which is negative 4 plus root 1682 all over negative 9.8, I don't know what you will get, but it will be a negative number. And in the context of this question, a negative time doesn't exist. And that's it. That's the lesson. But they're not always going to be problems that you encounter in calculus where you can start with negative 9.81. Many of them will be. But number five is certainly not. Margaret has found by proper choice of gear, she can steadily increase her speed on a bicycle. One day she sets out, 10 minutes later, she's at a cruising speed of 30 kilometers per hour. How far does she travel in 10 minutes? That is not a problem that you can solve with kinematics formulas. Well, you, you, maybe you could. 
but not initially. You've got to do some thinking here and determine what her acceleration is so you can anti-differentiate it to get a velocity function so that you can anti-differentiate it to get the position function so that you can answer the question. Um, number six here. We don't, uh, it's too bad we don't talk too much about this in high school physics. You understand that that negative 9.81 meters per second squared we talk about is a very short acceleration. That when objects are accelerating down, they don't continue to accelerate down at that rate forever. I, I want to say that the terminal velocity of a person falling through the air is around, depends on what you're doing in the air, depends on what you're wearing, and assuming your chute isn't opened, so I hope you have a chute, uh, terminal velocity is somewhere around 20 meters per second, I think. So if you, if you think about 20 meters per second downward and you're accelerating at 10 meters per second downward, the acceleration is short-lived. It's like two seconds. And then you reach what's called a terminal velocity. For a raindrop, well, it's saying the raindrop is accelerating for 10 seconds. But it is also experiencing this acceleration, which means it's not constant. And I just want to take a minute and talk about this a little bit. This is a formula for acceleration for the first 10 seconds of travel for a raindrop. I'm going to put that in for y, not to look at a graph, but to look at my table. I meant to go 0.5 because it's for 10 seconds or whatever. So half a second later, its acceleration is less. The physics of falling objects is more complicated than we treat in high school physics, especially for a raindrop. So its acceleration drops and drops and drops and drops and drops, like a raindrop does. And when it gets to 10 seconds, its acceleration is zero, which is why that formula is only good for the first 10 seconds. At that point in time, and this is I'm trying to help you out for doing this question later, Whatever speed it has at that point in time will be the speed it falls for the remainder of the trip. So things can get more complicated. You're going to have to, you know, as my old school teachers would say, put your thinking caps on and really think about these things. Um, I think it probably says 415, 1 to 5 on yours or 1 to 6? 1 to 6? You can also, on page 438, number 6 is a very similar one to the raindrop one I just did. 